Gary, how are you doing? Good. Um, I always use, or I have been using a Honda. Is there any big differences between the skis that you guys are using now from like any big changes, or are they all pretty much landed on the left? So, there are a few things uh, with the Honda. Uh, if you let it sit off for, so we'll kind of talk about that. Well, I guess we'll just get into it right now. One of the most important things, you know, as you're surfing with your sort of team, is knowing everybody's equipment. Uh, perfect example, I let a friend who's only been driving Yamahas uh, jump on my Honda once, and he didn't know, I just assumed that he'd been on skis his whole life, that if you let it sit off for longer than, I think it's five minutes, you have to push a secondary button before you can hit it. You have to push the red button, which yeah. basically it sets it, yeah, yeah. starts up the electrical system, and then you hit the green button. Yeah. So as he had kind of drifted into the lineup um, and was trying to hit the start button, it wouldn't start because he didn't know you had to hit the red button first. So, I mean, that's a the biggest difference, but I know you can do that as well, yeah. Um, so, you know, the importance of knowing, you know, everybody, you know, essentially everybody in the lineups, you know, the equipment to some extent, or having a standardized, you know, thing. So, yeah. you know, if I were to jump on Frank's ski, I know that he's going to have his spare land right there, you know, on that side. Yeah. So, that's kind of the bigger part of, you know, these communications and getting everybody um, you know, on the same page so they can all be sort of synchronized um, you know, in our understanding of what's going on out there. Um, and I know CDs, I don't see many of those out there anymore. Um, but the Yamaha's, I think, are the preferred one. Um, well, the rest of the time is discontinued. Uh, Ski's part of it, correct? Yeah. So, yeah. So, what's the one with the, the reverse throttle on the right hand? Um, so those are the newer Yamahas. Um, so rather than having like a reverse gate, there's actually an you know, electronic uh, lever. Um, yeah. I have I had some experience on those where uh, you kind of like use that to kick the sled out uh -huh. at, at your partner, whoever you're picking up. But at, at some time when they start cavitating, you like, it's like a little tricky where you're like coming head on almost with the guy. Yeah. I mean, ideally, you don't ever want to be putting your ski in reverse and impact zone, especially if you've got one like the yeah. Gate pull thing. People will do that where they kind of, you know, miss them and then throw it into reverse, to back up real quick, and they got it. Um, you're just uh, opening up the margin for error. That you know, sometimes those things stick a little bit and they don't go all the way back in and engage and drive. So um, trying to avoid that as much as you can with the you know, electronic, which is a lot easier, but it's just so convenient. You know, you still don't. I, I still don't trust them. Yeah, you know, full that's what I'm getting now. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, we kind of touched on it. It's it's an art, ever evolving. No matter where you go, there's going to be somebody with a different idea or technique that they think is relevant to their break, which might not be at um, another one. Uh, you know, some breaks right after you know, the first wave, um, the amount of kind of turbulence in the white water isn't so substantial that you can't go in and pick up the guy straight away. Where Frank or you know, anybody can attest if you try going in you know, immediately after you know, a giant wave at Mavericks, you're going to probably sink into a cauldron of water and bury your ski and you know, end up uh, a hazard by yourself. Uh, yeah, um, knowing, it, knowing the equipment and the equipment that people are, that you borrow mm -hmm. is really important. Um, Danilo came in and got me on a really, really big day. and. Uh, Came in, I was down for a long time. Hey, I came out of the fog, got the handle, got his arm, pulled me back onto the sled. I let go as I started to hit the sled. All the loops in the sled had been pulled flat. There was nothing <laughs> to hang on to. And I go, I go sliding off the sled and I grab the tow rope and, and I grab it for just a second and it was too late. I let go, realizing that there's another 60 footer, 50 footer, and Danilo's. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> he watched. Well, this whole um, scenario really has a bunch of. I'm going to try to make it short, but it was a lot of lessons of that day. Um, it was a foggy, humongous day. The west. direction wasn't northwest or west, it was a west-southwest, which is very rare. Really dangerous. 
Um, Toast session is happening. Jeff shows up with his son, Mr. Steve, and I am with my partner, Rodrigo. And Jeff, when I will serve, he's like, sure. My feeling right away was that I wanted to drive Jeff for some reason. But I really trust my partner. And I said, Rodrigo, he was on the ski, just, you know, just watch out for those west blowouts. <coughs> Big Seth comes in, Rodrigo pulls Jeff deep, Jeff kicks out, probably a 5 or 6 wave, 35, 40 foot, Hawaii, all day. And Jeff kicks out, and Rodrigo goes to pick Jeff up. And the whole thing happened with slab, flat, rope. And then the wave gets Jeff and Rodrigo uh, on the Honda. Yeah, on the Honda. And they got really destroyed, and I know it was bad. That's when I was in the channel with his ski, his son, a bunch of boards, hand photo, 20 boards, and I just pushed everybody and I went to go get Jeff. My Jeff son was, said, <laughs> the note says to Kevin, I gotta go. <laughs> and stick arms him off into the water. <laughs> and he has like 10 photos of 10 boards on his camera. So I just go straight to Jeff. Um, and as I'm coming to him, he, he was really just, he was already fading. He was already, his colors were already different. And he could barely see me. So I just had to really yell. So that's maybe the biggest lesson I like to share the, the verbal communication. I had to yell out of my, really hard. So Jeff, at that moment, he, his eyes really opened and he saw me. And that was the only time we had it. So put him on the slab and we made it. But I think you did got hurt from that whole situation. Your yeah. hip was there or? Just my feelings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we made it and then the whole the ski, kind of like that one. Um, yeah. And then we got to Puerto Rico, and we, he literally could he, he got his hand on the sled, but he couldn't get it on the sled and had to pull him out of the water. After we went to be yeah. 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 Just to bring us back to the sending and stuff too. So you guys, um, we can get into the whole process, right? And the, the five-step process, what Greg can teach you guys. Because what I like you guys to take away is if I hold up my five fingers at the end of the day, you're going to know what that represents. And this is what we're going to start getting into the meat of this also too. Yeah. Um, so what this is, again, is the whole thing, what you can see in this classroom, it's not a one-time thing. It's an art form. It's like martial arts of the ocean. You're only as good as you practice this and as you preach this and stuff too. So, go ahead, Greg. Yeah, so, it's, again, with repetition, kind of what we're, everything that we're going to go through, practicing with each other regularly. Um, and so identifying kind of the two archetypes of people who are usually out there. You've got uh, the risk taker versus the risk technician. Uh, oftentimes, the risk taker can be misinterpreted as if they know what they're doing, but they're out there kind of making uncalculated uh, movements, aren't really aware of their surroundings. Eventually, it's all going to catch up with them. And what we're trying to strive for is all be risk technicians, which is very thoughtful in our approach. Prior to ever entering the water in the lineup, knowing what the hazards are, uh, having good contact with medical facilities, technicians uh, in the area, with the surfers, uh, so to minimize the risks. Um, next slide. So, yeah, the risk technician, they can reasonably predict the outcome, mitigate the risks prior to going into the situation. Uh, with a risk taker, they're uh, gambling. This is, uh, Cole Christensen's actually a uh, very creative uh, PowerPoint here. Go ahead. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> risk takers are only guessing what's going to happen. Uh, but getting into the five-step process, which is the nuts and bolts of the price, and you know, what we really want to hone in on the takeaway. At this point, I think everybody can understand, you know, there's severe consequences, hazards, it's about managing those. So the process to doing so, uh, first identifying what those may be, and they can take on any shape and form. We'll kind of walk through a series of them in a moment. We're just going to go through the process here. Uh, assessing those hazards into risk. What is the likelihood that they uh, may occur? And what are the consequences should this actually come into play? Uh, 
the rocks at Mavericks, I would say, are probably one of the greatest hazards out there. What's the likelihood if I fall that I'm going to get washed into them on the West Well? Probably significant. Um, so kind of taking all that into account and then controlling the risk. Uh, what can I do to avoid this situation or you know, implement in the water that may minimize it? So if we go back and use that foggy west-southwest day, if you fall out there on a swell direction like that, it's not if you're going to go into the rocks, it's just a matter of how quickly you're going to. So, uh, implementing, or sorry, controls, and then implementing the controls, what would an uh, example of that be? You're going to have your safety ski right there to pick you up. Or potentially decide to not even surf that, that would be the greatest risk control that you could implement. Um, and then supervise and evaluate those at the end of the day, uh, and go back what actually worked, what didn't, restructure whatever protocols um, that you had established for that day that you know, maybe had some holes in them that you realized later on. And also ensure that everybody else uh, that's going out there, you know, uh, Jeff, I don't know, you're stewards of the Maverick Surf Break, so you know, standing up and being a voice for the newcomers, uh, you know, who are kind of, you know, flying by the seat of their pants, don't know what they're doing, to really supervise the situation, say, hey, this is, you know, sort of how, you know, we do it here, you know, we're welcome to share with you our knowledge, because uh, in the end, you know, somebody who comes out there, they're the weakest link in, in the group, um, and you know that you're going to go in there after them and try and help them, uh, should something go wrong, so essentially, you know, even though they're a hazard to themselves, they become a hazard to yourself and everybody else as well, so, um, really supervising the overall situation. So those are the five main points, uh, getting to get to the process of it. So looking back at the risks and hazards, uh, questions you might want to ask yourself, who's in the water? Uh, the greatest hazards, other than the rocks at Mavericks, I would say is the crowd. And you get a lot of newcomers out there who don't really know the etiquette where they're sitting, and they become liabilities for themselves, and essentially the other surfers in the water. So. Uh, boats in the channel who may not be aware of the break and a swell direction, what a wide swing set is going to do. Um, where is it dangerous? Where can you actually go and surf? Um, you know, sitting on the left or the right. And then, again, back to thinking about it before. These are the questions that you're going to ask before going out there. And then, what can you do to reduce all these risks that are going to come? Uh, with these potential situations. Well, just a quick, um, putting that in practice, you know, a lot of times, I mean, I'm not shy to come say hi to a local or somebody that I don't know, but I know a lot of people who are. Just remember that when you get down to, to, to create a process, the communication is always going to be number one. And come over and say hi and ask questions, introduce yourself as the first step. You know, you can't do anything on your own, isolated, and you know, just a reminder because those questions are going to really help put the process in place from beginning to end. Those are like standard things that, you know, just always looking at Luca here, it's a new generation who's going to go to the world eventually. And those are kind of like the questions you want to be ready before you even think about surfing, you know, touch base with the group. So communication, you know, break the ego. No, don't be shy, ask questions and go from there. Uh, for example, my very first time ever coming up here, I was invited by Grant Washburn, uh, who's, everybody knows Grant has put in uh, seconds, probably Jeff, more hours than anybody out there, and just asked him, can you show me around? And then was introduced to Jeff, and the two of them you know, literally walked me out there, told me all about you know, the rocks and which swell directions, uh, the water's going to be moving, where your safe points, uh, where your lineups are out there. And so for my first session out there, you know, I had uh, a good spatial awareness of what was happening. It gave me a comfort level to be able to perform. Um, and then also, if shit ever did go wrong, could you know, handle it and mitigate the situation myself. And that was just by asking. So um, it's one big way of surfing family. I don't think there's a big way of lineup or location in the world where if you reached out to the one local and asked for you know, advice, 
which to understand you know, what their whole program is there, that they would tell you no to get lost and be welcome with open arms. So, uh, next slide, please. 